a story in a story that is widely analogous to so many elements of black history the contributions of black musicians to country music and black songwriters black record producers black instrument makers all of those folks right has been seismic and yet their contributions have not been uh compensated or credited with any degree of the uh, uh the the level that they should be despite this um, black musicians and black songwriters continue to reinvent country music and continue to demonstrate uh, how important black music is to country uh, and to all forms of American music. So that's one. The second one, similarly, black listeners have always claimed country music as something that they love in part because it's from black traditions, right? But also because it's themes of love and work and making it through the day and and having a good time, right? All of these themes, the sacred themes and gospel themes that are so important in country music, right? These are themes that black listeners, of course, respond to and resonate with just like anybody does. And they have continued to do that even as this idea of country, whether it's the music or whether it's even the identity of being country, has become sort of culturally associated with white folks in a way that not only, of course, isn't reality, but is also something that has been very, very kind of contested and relates to the ways that we think about um, American politics and other, and other questions. It's amazing that last week y'all talked about Black borderlands and the West, right? And the way in which the movement of Black people around the country, in part, one of the things that it uh, it represents is this attempt to kind of demonstrate the continuing journeys and continuing reinventions of Black folks, sometimes by necessity because of discrimination and oppression and violence, but other times because of opportunities to uh, build new communities and do new things. So that's number two. And the third big point is that very much from the beginning to now, and certainly will continue to be the case, Black people and country music, that story is both a soundtrack for a larger story of resilience and reimagination in Black history, but it also helps shape this. We can understand historical moments. We can understand these crucial questions through the story of Black country musicians and Black country fans. So like I said, that's my most text-heavy thing, but I did just want to make those three points really heavy right off the top. All right, we can go to the next one. Got to make this point as clear as I can. I have, I'm long past tired arguing with people about whether or not country music is black music. Country music is black music, and it always has been. That does not mean that there. I don't not think you'll get any argument here. Excellent, <laughs> excellent. And of course, that doesn't mean that there haven't been other things incorporated. That there haven't been other things that are an important part of the call and response. But there is no question that from the beginning, country music is based. In not just African American music either, but African diasporic or African descended sounds from all over. The banjo, right, is an is a West African instrument that was brought to the United States by enslaved people who, even in the midst of slavery and in the face of this, found ways to create this or recreate this instrument that represented that culture and that life that have been stolen from black folks right by the by capture and enslavement and making it not only into an instrument that they use but this central american instrument right fiddle traditions are very much rooted in what enslaved and then freed black folks did and the music that they made string bands cowboy music the blues jazz gospel all of these things are fundamental to the development of what we think of as country music, both in the sense that these were the kinds of music that were made by the early country musicians, but also in the sense that if you go back and listen to music that was made and recorded in these early days of the genre, you can't tell if something is supposed to be country or blues or gospel of what kind, right? So black music, it always has been. You can go to the next one. And it continues to be. 
sometimes you'll hear folks talking about black music and country and they will say the they will acknowledge the importance of black music as an influence on early country right you'll hear that a lot you'll hear oh the blues is really important and gospel right the early days it was re and that's good because you know that's an improvement over some of the earlier versions of the story that erased black people entirely but I always like to point out that when we're thinking about the generations of country musicians, famous country musicians, as country becomes the thing we recognize, in every generation, country music has absorbed, adopted, appropriated, adapted, whatever, Black musical innovations. So for example, the Carter family here on the upper right in the 1920s, they're playing songs that are coming out of the blues and black songster traditions of traveling musicians who they heard. Patsy Cline on the top right, she is so steeped in jazz and vocal pop and early rhythm and blues. Kenny Rogers, who ends up working with Lionel Richie and does a lot of things with R&B. R&B so, so central to country music. Even more recently, artists like Florida Georgia Line, there on the bottom right, who are incorporating rap and hip hop and modern dance and R&B. At every stage along the way, country musicians have, have brought in black music, which on one level makes sense because they're musicians and this is great music, but it also puts up a real contrast with the fact that even as this continues to happen, black artists have not had and anywhere near an equal shot to become as famous as a Patsy Cline or a Kenny Rogers. And Black songwriters and musicians have their uh, accomplishments and talents drawn on as a resource without always being given anywhere near an equal chance. So I did just want to make that point because Black music of the 1890s, 1900s, 1910s is very important, obviously. But Black music of the 1980s, 1990s, it's the same dynamic a century across time. You can go to the next one. Okay, so how does this become a how does this become something that that occurs? How does country music get to have black music without giving access to black people? Right. On one level, that's a story as old as the United States. The the taking of black labor and of resources uh, and not paying back. Right. But it also has connections to some very specific historical moments. The historian Carl Hagstrom Miller calls about segregating sound, which he talks about taking place in the 1920s. The recording industry is really starting to boom in that period. People are loving buying records, having them in their houses, the jukeboxes, right? Radio is a thing now, right? So you have this moment where the record industry realizes that they could start marketing sounds to two constituencies of people who they hadn't really considered before. One of them is Southern white folks or white folks who had recently moved out of the South. They initially weren't particularly marketed to by the record industry because it was thought that they were low class, they didn't have any money, we didn't want their music was low, right? So they, the early industry didn't really mark, market to them. But then they realized they could make a lot of money off that. They also realized that they weren't marketing records to African-Americans. They were not actually investing in blues, in jazz, in gospel, in any kind of black music, just anything that was performed by a black person. Could be classical music, could be all these things. So there's this moment in the 20s when recording industries kind of create these two separate categories, one of which is called on the left here, you've got old time or hillbilly, the few words used for it, but it's basically, as you can see, what we would come to think of as country music. You've got your folks with the fiddles and the banjos and the guitars, and it's the fiddle and guitar craze is sweeping northward, right? So you've got that music. They also start marketing another kind of music that they call race records, which as you can tell is basically all of the universe of music of different kinds being produced by African-Americans gets clumped together in this category, not unlike segregation more generally, right? The thing about country music in this context is that even as there's this music that's being created and sold to white folks, 
hillbilly and what we now ultimately know as country music as being an all white thing obviously the sounds are still very deeply connected and in fact black string bands are playing things that could have been sold to white audiences white artists some are singing the blues and they could have right but the recording industry following in the model of Jim Crow America segregates sound. So now all of a sudden country becomes essentially thought of as off limits or even not even off limits to black folks thought of as this totally separate thing, despite the fact that the musicians, the listeners, the communities were very much bringing those sounds together, whether in sacred contexts, secular contexts, wherever. You can go to the next slide. All right, we're skipping ahead a few decades because the next really important thing happens right along the same time as the civil rights movement. Obviously, the civil rights movement transforms so much about the United States and music is no exception and country music is no exception. Finally, for a variety of reasons that are that I could go into if anybody's really interested, but finally, the country music industry starts to pay attention to all the black artists who are making country music. The first group of people to have real success are R&B and soul music artists, the, the predecessors of Beyonce in many ways. And they not only start to make country albums to indicate and show how much they loved country music, but they also occasionally have real huge success. So Ray Charles in 1963, records an album called Modern Sounds in Country and Western Music. And it becomes the first album, the first country album to go gold on the Billboard charts. The now, first what I love about country Modern or Sounds, just the first country period? What's that? You said the first country album, not first by country African album. American, the first country album, period. First country album, period. Wow. The very first country album to go gold in the United States was Ray Charles's Modern Sounds. And what I love about Modern Sounds is that, you know, Ray Charles loved country music. And, you know, most, almost every African-American musician of this generation who's commented on it has talked about how much they loved country music, right? But they understood that they weren't going to make it in country music because of the way that segregation worked in the music industry and alongside it, right? But Ray Charles, being Ray Charles, it's at that point in his career, he says, well, I want to make a country album. I'm Ray Charles, right? But what I love about Modern Sounds, beyond the fact that it's still a really beautiful, brilliant album that was a big hit, right? Is that, as you can see on the cover, he's wearing his suit. He calls it Modern Sounds. The songs are country as they come, but they're arranged with these beautiful, lush orchestrations, right? And I've always interpreted that, and I think he even spoke about this, as Ray Charles saying, not only will I do country as well as any of the white people can do it, but I will show you that we can do it as up-to-date and as new as pop. We are not just influences on this music. We're going to innovate, too, right? So then you get this whole, there's so many wonderful albums. I pulled out a couple here. The Supremes make an album of country songs. Tina Turner's first solo album is a country album because she's, you know, she loved country music, West Tennessee. It was in her, it was in her blood as it was for a lot of musicians of that generation. And I had to, I had to, to shout out Millie Jackson, who made a wonderful album in the early eighties called just a little bit country, uh, which I really think, you know, that, that album cover, I'd like to think Beyonce was thinking about that when she was posing on the horse in her amazing outfit. I'd like to think she was listening to, to, to Ms. Jackson. But so you have that. You have all of these RB and soul artists that are starting to push the doors open. And despite the fact that the industry and the idea of country remains very closed in, the changes of the civil rights era, the, 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 the changes forced by Black people, right? The ways in which African Americans demand and insist on these changes, combined with the money <laughs> made by Ray Charles and others, finally the door opens. A little bit. You can go to the next slide. And Charlie Pride walks through it. Charlie Pride, of course, from Sledge, Mississippi, lived in Memphis for a while, played baseball here. Um, Charlie Pride becomes the first sort of fully country promoted as country 
black country star. And he becomes a megastar, one of the most successful and one of the most popular country artists of that period. With beautiful, beautiful voice and these wonderful kind of honky-tonk ballads and all, he loved that kind of stuff. And he brings that Mississippi and Memphis sound to his voice and his storytelling. He talks about this stuff and he plays the music he wants to play. And he has talked about it at the time, you know, I've seen a lot of the old newspapers and stuff, like people both in the white press and the black press are talking about him as this Jackie Robinson of country music, right? As someone who's breaking down the boundaries. And indeed, Charlie Pride's success is so seismic and important. It demonstrates that now maybe we would be ready for a black country star, but also once again, that a black artist gets the opportunity and proves not only that he belongs in country music, but that he's as good at making country music as anybody else is. Can you go to the next one? Unfortunately, this moment does not lead to a broader, like at first everybody's thinking, Charlie Pride made it, we did it. We're gonna finally have a country music business that reflects the making of country music and the people who love it and the communities uh, that are contributing to it. That doesn't really happen. And part of why it doesn't happen is because this is also a period in which we have this rise of real white backlash to the civil rights movement, right? And you have a kind of, push down and back to try to either push back the successes of the movement or at least stop before anything else happens. And country music is kind of taken up by a bunch of conservative leaders at the time, people like George Wallace, people like Richard Nixon. They explicitly say, we think we're, we're only going to use country music in our rallies and in other ways because we want to make send this message to white America that we think they are the people who are getting looked down on. They wanted to sort of send this message. There are memos that are written by like strategist people working for Nixon saying, let's make it about country music and let's set, let's tell that silent majority that it's, you know, their music is the real music as opposed to this other stuff. So this effect not only re, like kind of reiterates this idea, this falsehood that country music is a white's only thing, while also putting real barriers down again uh, on the black artists who are having, hoping to take this moment after Charlie Pride to demonstrate just how good they are. I wanted to spotlight Linda Martell, uh, who it makes an amazing record in 1969 called Color Me Country, which the title says it all, right? She is claiming it because it's hers, but she's also trying to prove right? That it's, that it's her, that I know y'all talked last week about the white gaze, right? And the way in which something like color me country is really trying to prove an argument to white people that black people have been having to make and forced to make for way, way too long, even by 1969. So Linda Martell makes this fantastic album. It gets promoted on the Nashville company, but by that point, it's kind of not happening. She gets a top 40 hit. She gets to play on the Opry once, and then she's just kind of dropped. And a lot of the artists who follow after Charlie Pride get signed, have a little bit of success, but then the industry has no interest in pushing them. Another example I could have used with another Memphis connection and Mississippi connection is O.B. McClinton, who um, graduate of Rust College, the great Rust College, uh, and who uh, is a soul artist for a while working at Stax, but he hears Charlie Pride and he's like, maybe I can make it doing country. He has a little bit of success, uh, he's great, makes really interesting, fun, interesting country albums, but he never really gets it. And he was very, very, um, I don't want to say bitter because it does, because he does, he, he was justified in yeah. feeling uh, upset, but, um, but it was really, it, a lot of artists felt like I thought it was our moment, but ultimately it was, you can go to the next one. Again, we're going to have to skip it over a bunch of time. And I know y'all might have questions or want to talk, and I'm definitely trying to save some time for that. So um, uh, from the 1980s to the 2010s, you have the ongoing fight for recognition, the ongoing fight for the opportunities that were supposed to come after Ray Charles and Charlie Pride, but weren't. And these are happening in a couple of directions. You do have 
a few folks but breaking through and becoming mainstream country stars like Darius Rucker, right? Probably the best, the most famous example of this, uh, Darius Rucker, who, when he first comes out uh, with uh, the band Hootie and the Blowfish, he talks about how country he is and how he loves country music. Um, he finally gets to be uh, recorded in Nashville and make country music. And then he's asked in every interview that I read with him for years, the first question would always be, so what made you want to get started in country music? He constantly had to prove himself, even after he was a multi-platinum artist. Yeah, I remember the Darius Rucker moment. Like I just yes. remember, and I loved Hootie and the Blowfish. That's the other yes. thing. So I was kind of sad. I remember it for the wrong reason. But just to see him go in what felt to me such a radically different direction. Um, yeah, I remember that. That was a big seismic moment for those of us who loved Hootie and the Blowfish. Somebody else in the chat said, me too. You got some Darius Rucker fans in nice. here who are testifying in the chat. I, I Excellent. see. Excellent, yeah. Well, and, and it made, <laughs> and just, you know, it, when I first heard his first, like, officially country, it made so much sense. You know, you could hear in his voice. You could hear how much he was doing this. Um, you also had behind the scenes work. Uh, this picture on the left might be on the upper left is kind of a little hard to know what it is, but it's a collage of photos from a group called the Black Country Music Association, which is exactly what you think it is. Uh, African-American artists, writers, country music fans getting together in the 80s to try to advocate for each other. One of the stories of this whole history, as it is in every other aspect of African-American struggles for freedom. One of the most important aspects is community building behind the scenes in spaces, right? I don't know if they ever met in churches, but they could have, right? Churches being one of them. So the Black Country Music Association trying to find these ways to open the doors to people who are already there. Um, you have start to have collections of Black Country music, like From Where I Stand. You start to have a recognition of a tradition. You also have artists like Mickey Guyton. I don't know if anybody's listened to, to Ms. Guyton, but she emerges as maybe someone who finally will break through uh, an even firmer barrier uh, than the very few Black men who have made it in country of had to face. It's been even harder for Black women, despite the fact that Black women have always remained as they always have at the center of American musical culture. Um, black women have had a very hard time breaking through into the country mainstream, not because of anything that's their issue, but just because of not just racism, but sexism uh, and the way that black women often get pushed to the side and pushed to the background. But there was this whole period, things were building up and right around the end of this particular moment, like 2008, nine, that's where I start getting involved with this. So it seemed like something was happening. It seemed like something was building. Then you go to the next one. And then we have the Yeehaw Agenda moment. Oh, Lord, not not little Nas X. I, I didn't know we were going to go here tonight. Well, I'm not going to get into <laughs> Lil Nas X too much, but there's no doubt that Old Town Road, right, whatever you think about Lil Nas X, Old Town Road absolutely opened a conversation about these questions because the way in which his song was taken off country radio all of a sudden opened this door for conversations about why all these black artists weren't being on country radio. It opened a conversation about why all of these black fans of country music weren't getting a fair shake. It opened questions about why country's past was being mis misrepresented. It opened all these questions about why it was that when people talked about the, the real America or the small town America or all of these euphemisms that get used politically, a lot of the time when people were using those euphemisms, they were associating it almost entirely with whiteness. And black folks said, hey, we live in the country too. And we make country music too. And we always have. So you get moments like on the right, you get Dom Flemons, a great banjo player and scholar, uh, telling the history of black cowboys. You get this incredible group, Our Native Daughters, with Rhiannon Giddens, Al uh, Alison Russell, Amethyst Kia, and Layla McCalla coming in armed with their banjos and singing not only country music, but about black history and trying to reclaim traditions uh, that had been taken out. So it's this really important moment, which is also setting us up for the next slide for where we are right now, 
because here we are. Beyonce has always been country. Remember what Dr. Steptoe told me and now tells you, right? She's always been country. She's from Houston, Texas. Um, her mother, Tina Knowles, just uh, tweeted about this, about how, hey, we grew up in a cowboy culture city. We understand this. Her sister, Solange, made an album a few years ago all about black cowboys, right? She appeared with the formerly Dixie Chicks, now the Chicks. They dropped the Dixie from their name um, a couple years ago. She appeared with them at the Country Music Association Awards doing a country song. Of course, this year we had the Fanta, yes, Tracy Chapman, right? What an amazing moment in which this fantastic song and this fantastic artist gets a new moment, right? And I really loved on the Grammy Awards, I don't know if anybody saw it, but Luke Combs, who, <laughs> I didn't mean to crop him out of the photo, but it's kind of appropriate that, you know, white guy's over there somewhere. But <laughs> that hand, that's Luke Combs. Luke Combs, country artist, who really did, I think, come from a place of love and respect for this song, he duets with her. She had not appeared in, really at all in years, and he steps to the side, and just, you could see he was just admiring and respecting her work. There's a moment in the thing where she's singing, because it was his hit, right? Luke Combs has the big hit with Fast Car last year, but he lets her basically do the whole song, right? He stands to the side and he is looking at her and he's mouthing the words. He's like singing along with her. It's like he can't even, right? Which I would have done the same thing. So anyway, you have this amazing moment for Tracy Chapman. Hold on, I, I, also, I can't I can't let you go oh, yeah. past that point without telling the story. I already told you, I've always been a weird black girl. Tracy sure. Chapman, Fast Cars has just been my song. Like she wrote that for me. I'm glad y'all like it, but she wrote it for me. She was thinking yeah. about me when she wrote that song. But I remember not having other people to talk to about that song. Mm -hmm. And I vividly remember when I was in like a workplace setting and we had to name our theme song and people were naming all of these like R&B and hip hop songs. And, and I said, Tracy Chapman, Fast Cars, this room full of black professionals. And everybody looked at me like, what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> So I always thought like I was like a Tracy Chapman fan in hiding. Like I didn't know yeah. so many of us until I saw the Grammy performance. Yeah. I saw it all the outpouring of love. And I feel like it was so many of us who were like kind of afraid to say we like Tracy Chapman or didn't know how it was going to be received because you're talking about country. Uh, the conversation of black folks and folk music, right? Absolutely. You know, that's a whole deeper conversation. So uh that's right. Yeah, yeah. It's just this moment of these kind of this underground love almost rising up. That's what it felt like for me for Tracy uh, Absolutely. And a moment in which this great artist is kind of welcomed, welcomed back or welcomed in by a new generation too, right? Like not that, you know, the previous generation with Tracy Chapman has been there for her from the beginning, but it's, I completely agree. And like, just, it, and you know, she then in an interview said, you know, I always loved country music. This is, this is great, right? Um, so her moment is so important that I hope it continues. And I also, you know, you have all of these younger artists, some of whom are here on the bottom right, in the backstage of the Grand Ole Opry, talking with the current chief music critic in the Nashville, Tennessee, and uh, who is a black country fan named Marcus Dowling. And these artists are just a few who are working right now in this moment to try to make it not just about Beyonce's success, but about success for everybody. So I want to talk a little bit about the future. Because as I said, one of the problems with sometimes with the way black folks and country music get talked about is it only becomes a story of the past. But it's it's an amazing time. So if you can go ahead to the... Next one. First, I want to just mention a couple of things that are really worth your support. I did, I, want, I don't want to like hype too much stuff, but um, Linda Martell's granddaughter, the woman who had uh, a little bit of country success and then was basically abandoned by the industry, uh, she's working on a documentary about her grandmother. Her grandmother's still alive. Her grandmother has been able to bask in the love and admiration of a new generation, which is such a blessing in itself. Uh, so that's going to be fantastic. I encourage you to follow the Black Opry 
a group of amazing young musicians and record company creators and, you know, people doing all kinds of good stuff, making a little bit of good trouble along the way, as uh, as Representative Lewis would say. Um, they're fantastic. Color Me Country Radio with Reese Palmer. Not only a great radio show that's on Apple Music, uh, it's on Apple, um, but also her organization, Color Me Country, is funding grants for young uh, country artists of color to get started or to find some things. And then uh, Alice Randall, the first black woman to have a number one on the country charts that they wrote was actually not Tracy Chapman. She was the first one to write the song solely, but the first co-written number one was back in the 90s. We got any 90s country fans. Trisha Yearwood's song, X's and O's, was co-written by Alice Randall. And she is neck, like what great timing. In April, she's going to be putting out a memoir about being a black woman in country music and also an album of her songs done by Rhiannon Giddens, Reese Palmer, uh, all of these great young black women country artists. You move on, next one. And I'm not going to go through all these names, but I just want to say there are so many great young black country artists across all versions of the genre, the most radio ready stuff, the most traditional stuff, honky tonk, bluegrass, all kinds, right? Now and you got to give us a name so we can add them to our playlist. Just, okay, just roll, I, I, roll I will. Call them I right will. Quick. Okay. All right. So that he, right here is Trey Wellington. You know, I could even type him in. That might even be quicker. We got Trey Wellington on the top left with the banjo. Next to him is Jet Holden. Next to Mr. Holden is Blanco Brown. Yeah, I really wanted to know his name because he's kind of cute, but keep going. Yes, he is. He's got some good, like, he's, he makes a lot of great dance, dance party kind of country, so he's good for the party, too. Uh, Breland is right there. Uh, in the middle with the cowboy hat is Raina Roberts. Next to her is Lizzie No. She's more on your Americana side. She's got a little rock influence and, you know, she's doing really interesting stuff. She's also a great, she's a harpist, a classically trained harpist too. So brings that in. Bottom row, or the bottom row on the left is Roberta Lee, uh, a former teacher from Virginia uh, who put out maybe my favorite country album by anybody last year called Too Much of a Woman. And the too much of a woman is if I'm too much of a woman, you're not enough of a man. Uh, and the whole album, that's basically the discussion. It's a great album. Um, and then we have Adia Victoria next to her, uh, who is really trying to reckon with the history of the South and the United States. Some of her stuff is really intensely thinking about traditions, some bad and some magical. Tanner Adele. In the green cowboy hat. And the last uh, one is Millie Vanilli, right? That's who that is. What's that? <laughs> the last duo. Is that that's not <laughs> Millie Vanilli. Although that's really funny. No, in fact, that is a, those are twin brothers named the Kentucky Gentlemen. And they, uh, they're, they're putting out a new song on Friday, I, I heard, tomorrow, called Beg Your Parton, P-A-R-T-O-N, about Ms. Dolly. So, these are just a few of the names, but and honestly, they're all fantastic. But there's so many great artists right now doing this music, representing the latest generation of innovation in Black country and the sign of the way that this ongoing call and response, call and response being, of course, a product of the Black church that is such a wonderful, uh, revolutionary way to think about conversations across time and communities. Um, these are just some of the young black artists who are building on this moment, but who are also building on the past that goes all the way back to people who rebuilt banjos when they had no other form of instrumentation and when they weren't allowed to communicate because they knew that it was their music and it always would be. Now you can go to the next one real briefly. Black people have always loved country music. Always. 
The question is whether country, and more importantly, maybe the country it claims to represent, will love them back. But in the words of that song that we've talked about now a little bit, to paraphrase it, me, myself, I got nothing to prove, as Tracy Chapman said in Fast Car. And I just want to briefly close, we can go to the next one, with about 30 seconds of the Black Opry review. A few of those young Black country artists doing Fast Car three years ago, before Luke Combs, before this moment, calling in, in a sense, the spirits of this tradition and presaging the moment we're living in right now. So yeah, we can just play a little bit of this. It's so mad, any place is better. Starting from zero, got nothing to lose. Maybe we can make something. Just be myself and I'm looking to prove. I could put that I could put that link to that whole clip in the chat too if y'all want to see it. But um <laughs> they themselves they have nothing to prove and they never have. So I we have some time for conversation, I think. I, I know that was a whirlwind as a whirlwind tour. Uh, but I, I really would love to to talk with y'all and 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 if we Anybody, I and mean, you can unmute. I guess you know, I'll do the unmuting thing or in the chat, whatever, whatever works. And I'll try to. Before we open it up for questions, can we just thank him? Can we unmute and just clap and thank him? Because that was just a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant span through time. Yeah. Thank, thank, you. thank you so much. You can loving it, love it. Beautiful in the chat. Yeah, that was that was uh just a march through time, and it was fun. It was a yeah. fun march through time. Yeah, you got a heart from uh, Deacon Sean. And Deacon Sean, I don't think Deacon Sean is giving me a heart. So you are- Oh, well, all right, all right. Might, I might have lost yeah. my job tonight from you. <laughs> oh, well, I don't know. Right, right, right. No shade know. or slight to Dr. Cat. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had, to up right. my, I had to up my game after your your introductory. Like, I was like, oh, this is, I got to be smarter than, <laughs> like, you know, Dr. Stout is going to show me up. No, no, you you were you were great. I have a question, and then I mm -hmm. will invite you guys to unmute or put questions in the chat. So here's my question: As I was thinking the whole time, as you were showing the slides, and I did take a peek at the slides beforehand, and I was like, "Hmm, there is no K Michelle, right? Hey. Couldn't K Michelle, who just dropped a country album from right here in Memphis, so." Tell right. me about where she fits in this and and maybe why you didn't think she was ready for the <laughs> slideshow. <laughs> oh, well, it was nothing personal. You're absolutely right. Um, I think she's fantastic. I love the country stuff she's been doing. Um, I can't wait to hear. I hope she's another one of those folk, people who the moment that we're getting of, you know, the attention to the young Black country artists and to people doing these really amazing mixes of stuff. Like she has a track that's called, I think called Tennessee, that is just such a fantastic mix of the state's music, right? You know, so often we kind of, and again, this is another product of a, a segregated recording industry in specific and just segregated America more broadly, right? You know, you get this idea of like Memphis and Nashville represent these two supposedly different things, musically and otherwise, right? And I mean, you know, it's not that there's not some truth to some of that, but the way in which you get these blends of musicians kind of drawing on just in the Tennessee context, and then you get the East Tennessee, you, know, you get the kind of the string bands too. So no, no, there was no shade on K. Michelle, or I saw Wendy Moten got a shout out in the chat. Absolutely. Um, both K. Michelle and Wendy Moten, so great in this moment. It's, it's again, it's an embarrassment of riches right now 
of all of these great artists doing this work and getting a chance to get it out in the world, right? Like there've always been a ton of great black musicians making country, making everything else. But thanks to, you know, the digital world and thanks to the way things have changed, thanks to people organizing communities to be like, hey, check these artists out. Now we're starting to get to hear them and the gatekeepers who set up those boundaries did segregated by race and other things, they don't have as much power as they used to. I mean, country radio is really powerful, but all it took was one afternoon of the Bay Hive of Beyonce's fans saying, why aren't you playing Texas Hold'em? It's a country song, which it is. Um, and they were like, oh, you're right. <laughs> right. So now they are. And that I think is a good thing because it's organizing and and it's in the service of something that I think is right. So I went a little bit off topic there, but but no, not that K Michelle's great. Wendy Moten is great, and I'm I'm sure there are other artists that we can share. Are so many, Chapel Heart, yes, somebody uh, Tracy Cunningham, Chapel Heart, absolutely a great trio, um, really just fantastic, and they've gotten some attention, which is lovely. Yeah, they're doing great stuff too. Um. Yeah, there's so many. There really the are. Chapel Heart was the group on America's Got Talent, and yeah. I think they did. It was a response to what was their song? It was what was it in response to the? It was it Jolene. Was sort of, yeah. Jolene. Yes, yeah. if you know the famous song, Jo. I won't sing. Well, I'll sing it so you know. Jolene, Jolene. You know that song right there. They made a response album to Jolene. And they uh did they win America's Got Talent? They said you can have Jolene. Yes, you can have him. Right, Jolene. right. You can have yeah. him, Jolene. Yeah. Right, 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 right. Yep. Which is also, you know, there's something so wonderful about the tradition of answer songs and you know, music that talks across to other songs, including and things like, you know, like I I love you can have him, Jolene. And thank you for bringing that in, Ms. Cunningham. Uh, other questions? Anybody want to throw a question in the chat or unmute and ask a question? I have a question, Dr. Hughes. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I was wondering what you thought about the Elvis movie with Austin <laughs> Butler and how accurate is that when it tells the genesis of, of Elvis's uh, musical gifts? And what would you add to that or take away? Wow, that's a really good question. Um, I thought the movie, I thought the Elvis movie was good in some ways, um, but in terms of the early stuff about his the the creation of his sound, I definitely like that it it talked about the way in which he drew from and you know took from uh, black music and black innovators, especially Big Mama Thornton and others. Um, I the thing about that too is that like there is no question that the fact that Elvis was a white kid who could do this kind of music made him much more interesting to white record companies and others. Um he had a kind of complicated relationship to it, but I I I kind of wish that the ways that we talked about Elvis and black music, we really did. We really talked about like Sam Phillips and black music or record companies and black music because Elvis is a musician, right? And Elvis also, from what we can tell, sort of in the movie, sort of not. Elvis was, I mean, you know, th there's, there's certain things about him that suggested that he really understood the kind of weird place he was in. He would always talk about his, the black musicians he loved. Now he kept the money, right? I don't think he sent. I don't think he sent any checks to the black musicians he loved, but he did at least do that. But on the other hand, you know, Sam Phillips at Sun Records gets a lot of credit for kind of breaking down these racial boundaries. But the story of Sam Phillips is he was recording black musicians in Memphis. They were giving him success: Rufus Thomas, Little Junior Parker, all these great musicians. Uh, and then he found a white kid who could he thought was good and he just abandoned all the black artists. So then all of a sudden it becomes all the white musicians who do black music, right? Which is much more appealing to white folks, at least at that time. So 
I don't know. I I mean, it's it's funny. I it I thought the movie was was all right. I thought it got some things about it good. I'm glad that the that there was that sort of discussion of like Sister Rosetta Tharp and Big Mama Thornton and other fo- you know Sister Rosetta Tharp among many other things. One of the examples of how central gospel music is to rock and roll, something that doesn't often get talked about, how important the church always was, this idea that the music was different or that it was separate. Like gospel music is so much of what gives rock and roll or R&B or other things its drive, its energy, its spirit. Um, the roots of rock and roll are in the church just as much as they are anywhere else. Um, anyway, now I'm off topic again, but it's it's an interesting movie. What do you think? I, I I want to uplift that and y'all can disinvite me from the cookout for saying this. <laughs> I think we have gotten the narrative of Elvis wrong. Hmm. And I think our anger is displaced on Elvis when it really should be towards Elvis Presley Enterprises and Elvis's handlers. Because if you really read his biography, uh, if you really study his life, uh, he was much more authentic than people give it credit for. And he was much more uh, race conscious than his handlers tried to present him as. And so I really think it's the handlers of Elvis. And yes, I will even say Elvis Presley Enterprises and their disassociation and disconnection with Whitehaven and black folks in Whitehaven. Absolutely. The house that I grew up in with my, with my biological dad is now owned by Elvis Presley Enterprises, where the the hotel is. I used to live in those apartments right there, right? So I grew up around the cult of Elvis. And I always said, Graceland never opened its gates to us. Right. right? And so it is the people who created the persona of Elvis. And as someone who creates personas for a living, I know how that is done. (laughs) Not necessarily the man himself. But that's Absolutely. a whole different topic. And, I and I, I can... invite people to cook out. I'll tell y'all something else. If y'all disinvite me, y'all have to disinvite my mama. My mama <laughs> wrote love love letters to Elvis when she was a teenager. There you go. You can tease her about that on Sunday. Well, and and you know the other thing too. I I completely agree with Dr. Stout. And also, you know, I think it's like I I, I think there are ways in which when we when we take that you know, music is such a beautiful one, you know, we make it, we make a joyful noise unto the Lord, right? We create these sounds, but because of the way music becomes a business, we have to think about stuff like that. And the reality is that the structure of the American recording industry has long been designed to promote white people instead of black, right? Or at least to promote white people as major stars and black folks as supposedly niche artists, right? Or just within certain communities. Um, and you see this all throughout throughout history. So I think Elvis deserves to be placed in there in the way he is. But also, as you say, we got to talk about who's making not just the money that Elvis made, but who's creating these worlds uh, and building their own wealth by explicitly creating and finding white musicians who like black music and who could kind of you know make this interesting sound the other one thing i'll always tell about elvis is that you know the the thing about elvis that i always mention to my students at rhodes is that you know in the late 1950s right and in the early particularly the late 50s when elvis first emerges as kind of kind of weirdo kid from memphis with weird hair and you know doing all this stuff he was sort of strange too um the other thing about this is the like the enemies of integration, the enemies of civil rights, they looked at Elvis as a threat. Now, whether or not he was is a very different question, but he was really scary to a lot of people who were on the wrong side of history. Now, I'm not saying that makes him a hero of anything, really not, um, but it's a very interesting thing to think about. I think we have uh, time for maybe one more question. I see our pastor is on the call. I don't know if she's at a place where she can unmute, but maybe we'll take one more question and then try to close it out because I want to be a good steward of time. One more question. Uh, and it welcome you to unmute and ask this brilliant scholar why you have the man who wrote the book on country and race in front of you. Uh, I welcome you to ask one more question.
I don't have a question, but I will say that this has been fascinating. You know, you don't know, um, well, you think you know a whole lot till you run into somebody like you. <laughs> and I thought um, I grew up listening to all kinds of music. I even know um, that Prince wrote a song for Kenny Rogers. Right, right. Yeah. And so, you know, who would have thought that? But tonight I have learned so much. And the only thing about it is, you know, you don't have a whole, it's only 24 hours of a day and you end the day and you make me want to go back and read about everything you talked about. So, oh but but that that's a pat on the back to you. That's, this has been great. And thank you, Dr. Stewart. Thank you, Dr. Stout. And thank you, Mr. Heath. Well, thank you. Well, thank, you. thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Lester. Dr. Lester. Also, um, you know, no, first of all, I, and I really, I really do mean this, you know, Dr. Stout can send you my, my email address. If you, if you don't have it, I would love to talk with anybody. And I'll also, you know, I know that Dr. Stout was writing down books and stuff that I was mentioning. Um, I'd be happy to, to, to give you not, not a long, it's just like a syllabus. You're not, you know, I'm, you know I'm, I'm not doing it that way, but I'd love to give you a couple book recommendations or other things. If you're, if anyone's interested in this, because it's a really, it's a really important uh, tradition and and a lot of folks I think are 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 finding out so many things and we're all still learning but I so I so appreciate being invited here and I thank you all so much and I really do please keep in touch and uh, and I would love to to talk more about this and and if if you hear anything cool or if there are artists you like who we didn't talk about uh email me let's talk about them because either i'll be like yeah why didn't we talk about them or i may not have heard them and i always love hearing great new music so whether it's new or old or whatever so please please do um do that and thank you so much again for inviting me into this really wonderful space thank you guys so much thank you so much for being on i'm going to invite pastor to unmute herself if she can i don't know if she's in a place where she can uh I want you to scroll up in the chat. All of the names of the new country artists that he was mentioning when we did the roll call, they are in the chat. We know if we don't support them, finish it for me. If we don't support them, no one will. That's right. No one will. So if you are on Instagram, Apple Music, Spotify, even if you don't like country music, just play it right? Just play it once because that gives them hits, right? And that sends a message to other producers, other record companies that we should invest in this. This is how we support our, our community. And this is how we say we have always been here. But not only that we have always been here, but we will always be here and we will excel and succeed in it. Thank you guys so much. And again, thank you so much to uh, Geek and Sean, who was in her zone tonight with all the music talk. Uh, Dr. Hughes, bravo. Thank you for saying yes. We really, really appreciate you. Please see all the love you're getting in the chat. And we wrap up our Black History Intensive next week. So if you've enjoyed this, please come back for the last one next week and invite somebody. We're going to have fun. So we wrap up the fourth and last installment next week. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate you all for joining us on a Thursday night.